We're at the point where we can process a form, but on the other side of the topic is validation. We need to be able to ensure that the values entered on the form are all valid before we allow the object to be sent to the model layer. So in this chapter, we'll look at how to trap conversion errors. We're going to need to present error messages on the screen. And to do so, we will need to set up a so-called resource bundle. Now we haven't worked with one of these yet, so we'll have a 10 minute talk about those. And then finally, I'll show you how to do programmatic validation. There's actually a better way of doing validation, and we will be covering that in the next chapter. But many projects use this programmatic validation, so we will need to cover that first. So we've got the form working when all is well, but now for perhaps the most important aspect of form handling, and that's the representation that I mentioned before. At the moment, leaving any of the first three fields blank is letting bad data get into the system. And even worse, entering a non-numeric value into the price field is giving us a really hideous crash. What can we do? Well, let's start by attacking the problem of the price field. Now we're getting that really hideous crash because Spring is trying to convert the string into a regular Java double. What we need to do is to trap conversion errors. And the way we do it is by adding an additional parameter to the submit method. It's from a class called errors. And this is really just an object that represents the details of any errors that Spring encountered when converting the form into a backing object. Armed with this, we can then programmatically check if there were any errors via the hasErrors method. If that returns true, then we can go back to the form page, that's the representation. And by passing across the book object, any good values that we entered will be represented. So let's give that a try. So then as on the caption, I'm just going to add in to my process form method, a second parameter from the spring errors class. We'll call it result and we'll do an import as usual. And then I just need that little bit of logic at the top. If result dot has errors, then we will return a different model and view this time to return us back to the add new book .jsp page. And for representation, we're going to send back the book as it's currently set up. So any fields that were entered that are valid will still be in place on the form, or at least we hope so. Let's deploy that. And let's try that out on the browser. And let's enter an invalid price, any old garbage we like in there, and then add new book. And I don't know if you noticed, but the button is pressing and a form submission is happening and we're no longer getting the crash. I think the form is being represented. If we add in a good title and click on add new book, notice we're not losing any of the good data that we've added into the form. So we are getting the representation, but unfortunately we're getting nothing in the way of feedback back to the user about what's gone wrong. And this is where the Spring Form Library comes in useful again. So here's a fragment of my JSP, and you've seen most of this already. In order to display any errors that have happened during conversion and validation, we need to use this Spring Form tag called errors. It takes two parameters. The first parameter is rather confusingly called path, and it really just means the field that we're validating. So for us, this would be ISBN, title, price, and author. And the second parameter is the name of a CSS class that you want to use to display the output. And that's because almost always you want to emphasize this particular text. You want to give it a special styling. 
so you can optionally specify a regular CSS class right here. As CSS is beyond the scope of this course, I've already provided for you a CSS class called Error in the CSS style sheet that we've been using through the course. And what I'm planning to do is to use a slightly smaller font size, a nice scarlet red color to emphasize the error, and I'm going to align the error alongside the other text fields. Okay, well, let's add this to our live code. So I'll just find my addnewbook.jsp file, and this is our form as it's been so far. And I'm going to add for each field, this is the ISBN field here, and just uh, one of my preferences, and I can essentially put this anywhere I like, but one of my preferences is to align it with the input tag. So I can immediately see where the input field and the corresponding errors are. So form call on errors, path equals ISBN, CSS class equals error. And I'm afraid it's probably a copy and paste job for the other four, or the three fields rather. I've made a bit of a mess of that. Nicely aligned. Okay, and I must remember to change the paths, title, author, and price. So with that change in place, we'll redeploy and see if we get some kind of visual feedback. Okay then, so in the browser, I don't really need to refresh what I had before. In fact, I can click on add new book. That will be a new request. And, and well, okay, we are getting an error message, but it's not a very nice one. It looks like a complete load of gibberish. In fact, it's, it's largely part of the stack trace that we were seeing on the horrible crash before. Now, of course, we need decent error messages. In order to set up error messages, we first have to create a message bundle. Now, I haven't mentioned message bundles so far. We could have done a separate chapter on this, but I think they would probably be best covered here. So allow me a digression for a few moments. A message bundle is a properties file which contains all of the text that you want to display on a web page. And instead of hard coding the text on your web page, we can tell Spring MVC to use placeholders for those text strings on your web page instead. So to put that another way, a message bundle is a properties file that's containing all of the text that you're planning to display on your web page, removing, if you like, the hard coding from your web page. There's a few reasons for doing this, but the main purpose would be to allow you to change the languages that you support for your web application. We could just have placeholders on all of our JSP pages, and then we could have a separate message bundle for every language that we want to support. This process is a key part of the general process known as internationalization. Now, even if you're not interested in internationalization, and we won't be talking much about it on this course, we still need to use message bundles when we're handling errors on forms. So let's spend a few moments looking at the theory of how to build a message bundle. Well, this is what a message bundle looks like. I'm calling this file messages.properties, and I'll be going across to Eclipse in a moment to show you it for real. But a message bundle is nothing more than a series of key value pairs. The keys are just made up labels, and they can be anything you like. We tend to use dots in the keys to come up with some kind of a hierarchy. And in this message bundle, I'm capturing all of the strings that I want to display on my Enter Book Details page. Starting with the first line, the title of the page is going to be Enter Book Details. And instead of hard coding that onto the JSP, I'm instead going to use the key called title.addbook. 
Then I need a series of labels for the form. ISBN number, title, author and price. So in the next block here, I'm using the key of book.isbn is going to be the value ISBN number. And then the key book.title will be the value title and so on. This idea of using keys with dots in them is just so we can provide some kind of hierarchy so that every label related to a book is preceded by the label book dot. We'll need strings on the buttons at the bottom as well, such as submit form and reset values. So I'm also providing key value pairs there. So as this is a fairly routine file, I've already provided this for you, or at least the start point of it. You will find it in your webin folder in your code area and I've called the file messages.properties and there are the key values that you saw on the previous caption. Now a common problem with these properties files is that when they're copied into the war file for deployment they must end up in the classes folder rather than the webin folder. So although I've put them in webin in my local project area that's just because it seemed like a good place to store them. I could have created another.